to a departure from the usual program. This is now the real world we're in now. Uh, although may maybe it should have been called continuous computing, I think is maybe a uh, better title. And the first talk is uh, Dan Zheng, who's going to tell us uh, if you've implemented differentiable automatic differentiation before and you weren't using control operators, you're probably doing it wrong. And this is a good way to do it. Thank you. Welcome to the real world. So my name is Dan Zheng. Um, today I'll be presenting Demystifying Differentiable Programming. Uh, this is researched at Purdue University, and I worked on the project as an undergraduate, and I'm now at Google Brain working on a project called Swift for TensorFlow. So let me start by talking about deep learning and neural networks. So as I'm sure you know, um, deep learning and neural networks have many real-world applications, and traditionally, um, neural networks have been viewed as a composition of layers. And while that's true, um, there's a growing diversity in network architectures. So there's a whole bunch of layer types and connection types. So things seem very complicated. But in fact, all of these neural networks are just parameterized functions. They take in some input x, return some output y, and are parameterized based on weights data. And these are actually continuous functions, so they can be differentiated. And so there's an algorithm called backpropagation for uh, training neural networks. Basically, parameterized or uh, updated based on their derivatives to minimize the loss function. And so this backpropagation is a specific application of differentiation. So as the PL community is um, becoming more interested in deep learning, there's been a trend towards differentiable programming. So rather than thinking of neural networks as layered data structures, we can think of them as functional programs that can be differentiated. And all of this is powered by a technique called automatic differentiation, or AD. So this is an alg algorithmic way to compute derivatives of programs. So today I'll be talking about AD and um, investigating some common ideas about AD. So those include AD is not symbolic differentiation, which is a simpler approach, and also that reverse mode AD is complicated. So let's investigate these ideas using functional programming techniques and see if we can demystify things. So the first idea is AD versus symbolic, differenti uh, symbolic differentiation. And so if I have a simple expression language with addition and multiplication, we can write some simple derivative rules, like the derivative of a constant is 0, the derivative with respect to x is 1, and so on. We have the uh, sum and product rule here as well. So these rules might look uh, familiar from high school calculus. So one commonly cited problem with symbolic differentiation is that it leads to this code explosion. So just by differenti differentiating a simple expression, like x squared plus x cubed, we have these nested differential operator calls, and there are many common sub-expressions, which are not efficient. But as functional programmers, we know that we can solve this via an ANF transformation. So if we add a let expression to our language and also write a rule for its derivative, we see that there's only one additional let binding in the derivative expression uh, for every let binding in the original expression. So the derivative has the same asymptotic complexity. And it turns out that this combination of ANF and symbolic differentiation is actually what's known as forward mode automatic differentiation. So this is a very well-explored technique, and it's been implemented in many languages. So here's what it looks like in Scala, which I'll be using for this talk. So we have this dual number type, which represents a pair of a value and its derivative. And we overload math operations so that they compute the original value and derivative values at the same time. We also have this differential operator, which takes in a function over these numbers and an initial argument x. So we apply um, f to x with the initial derivative value of 1, and then we return the derivative with respect to the output. So this is differentiation. Here's a simple example of how to use it. And so forward node AD is uh, understood as something that's quite simple. So you can implement it in just a few lines of code in different languages. So is forward node AD the end? The answer is it's not, because it's not efficient for functions to have a um, smaller dimensionality output compared to the input. And that's the case for deep learning. So deep learning um, involves functions with many large parameters, but just a single uh, scalar codomain uh, output. So backpropagation, or reverse mode AD, is more efficient for these cases. So let's walk through an example of reverse mode AD. So let's look at the same expression in ANF form. So there are a few steps that we need to take. First, we perform a forward pass in which we compute the original values, setting their derivatives to 0. Then we set the derivative of the output to 1, and then we perform a backward pass, sort of in the reverse order, in which we compute and accumulate derivatives with respect to some symbolic rules. So these are sort of modified forms of the sum and product rule that you saw earlier. And so you can sort of see why um, people might think that reverse mode AD is complicated. We have this uh, sort of reverse program execution. We do a forward pass, but then we have to go back again. Um, and sometimes it's implemented via a non-local code transformation. 
involving mutable tape-based data structures to record the program execution. But let's look at this in a different light. If we think of each operation as a horizontal slice with a forward component, a hole in the middle, and a backward component, um, then we realize we can model these holes using continuations. So that makes things easier. So let's look, let's, so let's look at the implementation of this using explicit continuations in Scala. So we augment uh, the math operators to take an explicit continuation parameter k. So we apply a forward computation, then call k on the output y, and then update the derivatives. So again, we have a different draw operator. Its signature is a bit different uh, to account for the continuation. And in the innermost continuation, we set the derivative of the output to be 1. Great. So how does it actually look to compute derivatives using this grad operator? Well, the answer, it's not so great, because the continuations are explicit, so we have this callback hell. So how can we sugar these continuations to be nicer to use? Well, the answer that we found in the paper is uh, to use the limited control operator, shift and reset. So these are well explored and available in many languages, like Scheme and OCaml, and also in Scala, via a type-directed selective transformation. So we have this type annotation, um, A at CPSB. Basically, this is used uh, by shift and reset to uh, well, this basically keeps track of the shift and reset operators. So you can use, so shift can be used anywhere um, where a value of type A is expected, but it must be within a reset context of type B. So here's what um, a different implementation looks like using delimited continuations. So the operators now use shift, which provide the continuation, and the different draw operator now uh, uses this type annotation and sets the uh, derivative of the output to one within a reset block. And this allows us to get back to the normal syntax. So this is great. We solved the usability problem. And so that's sort of uh, one of the themes of the paper. Um, reverse mode AD is really um, using shift and reset, um, along with symbolic differentiation rules. So since this is the real world session, uh, what about the real world performance of this approach? So to explain that, let me talk briefly about some existing deep learning frameworks which implement reverse mode AD. So some frameworks like PyTorch are dynamic, and they're they are this interpreter-based approach, so operations are dispatched eagerly. When I call x plus x, um, the addition operation dispatches immediately. Other frameworks like TensorFlow are a more static and compiled approach, so users explicitly build up this graph of operations via a DSL and then run the graph explicitly. So traditionally, this approach has led to more optimizations because the graph is like a whole program, so you can do whole program optimizations, like operator fusion. So this sounds a lot like multi-stage programming. Um, we're building a static program, then optimizing it, and then applying dynamic inputs to it. So if we realize that TensorFlow is really just multi-stage programming, then we can apply more generic multi-stage programming techniques to achieve the performance of TensorFlow uh, while gaining more expressivity. And so uh, that's what we did in the paper. So we used a multi-stage programming technique called lightweight modular staging in Scala, which is a runtime code generation approach. So uh, the key thing here is this rep type constructor. Rep stands for representation. And it's a stage computation of some type. So rep, rep expressions are lowered directly in the generated code, but non-rep expressions are basically evaluated at compile time and they become constants. So this is a form of partial evaluation. So our mental language here is Scala, and our target language is C++ and CUDA for performance. So since we formulated reverse mode AD using shift and reset, a natural question is, does the target language need to support shift and reset as well? And the answer is no, because multi-stage programs uh, that use continuations at generation time can generate code in CPS. Basically, we can use shift and reset in the middle language, but we'll generate code in CPS in the target language. We also explored some alternative transformations of the paper, but uh, I'll focus on this approach for now. All right, so, so far, we focused on AD on just straight line code, um, just addition and multiplication. But in practice, neural networks make use of control flow. So there are conditionals for piecewise computation, loops for repeated computation, and even general recursion uh, for algorithms like tree traversals. So this is useful for um, traversing over tree data structures like sentence parse trees or ASTs. So we need ways to differentiate these as well. So before I get into the rules, I want to introduce some notation. So this is our language. It's a lambda calculus with tuples, with mutable references, um, with some types and case expressions, as well as shift and reset. In the upcoming slides, you'll see overlines representing meta-language uh, constructs and underlines representing target language constructs. And this curly D operator is the reverse mode AD transformation. So here's the rule for conditionals. 
we can represent conditionals as basically case expressions over boolean sum type and so here's the transformation rule for case expressions so this is actually not an innovation from our paper it's explored in the original paper by don b and flinsky regarding a two-stage sort of cbs transformation so basically it looks kind of complicated but it's basically cbs conversion and a meta language that supports shift and reset so shift provides us with the continuation k we're generating that as a dynamic function uh, to avoid code duplication, and then we're applying it to each branch of the case expression. So from, this, from these rules, we derive this code directly. So if takes a, condition, a Boolean condition, as well as if and uh, else branches, and it matches up with the rules. Next, let me talk about loops. So we all know that we can represent loops using Kell recursive functions. And so um, that's what the rule here shows. We have blot rec f, and the body is a self-application of f. And again, we derived the code um, in a straightforward way. So we did the work in the paper, but um, so you can read the paper for more details. So finally, let me talk about functions and general recursion. So we need some utility to produce stage functions in CBS. And so the main thing that's going on here is we're generating a function with a proper continuation argument, k1. And when we return from the function, we invoke the continuation. So here are the formal rules again. So we can use this uh, fun utility to implement a differentiable tree traversal with initial value, a tree structure, and a function for composing values from the tree. So I wanted to show an end-to-end -end example of how our, our approach works. So here's, um, we're getting the gradient of a while loop where the condition is checking to see if the original value is greater than one, and the loop body is multiplying by a half. So if we inline grad and while, uh, we get this code. You can see the recursive function loop and this, gener and this generates uh, the following CPF, uh, th this generates the following C++ code. So it's pretty straightforward. Notice that rep is a compile time uh, sort of concept, so it's uh, compiled away, and all we're left is with is these uh, tuples of basically uh, original value and immutable uh, derivative value. So now let's put things together uh, to see how this works for deep learning. So to scale up to deep learning, we need to represent the main data of deep learning, which is these n-dimensional arrays, uh, which have a shape of dimensions as, and also data of that shape. And to make it differentiable, we basically use the same value derivative pair. And we can define operations on tensors in the same way. We evaluated our approach in a deep learning library called Lantern, which is available in GitHub, and we implemented some representative real-world deep learning models that involves uh, some baseline models like ResNet50 and SqueezeNet for image recognition, as well as a complex model, uh, dSpeech2, for audio speech recognition, as well as a recursive neural network that uses a sort of tree traversal. And we compared the performance versus some popular deep learning libraries. So here are the results. Um, it turns out that Lantern is as fast or faster for these models um, compared to popular frameworks. So it's about the same for SqueezeNet and ResNet. It's a bit faster for dSpeech compared with PyTorch because of some better uh, choices of kernel functions. And it's significantly faster than PyTorch for tree LSTM which is the sort of complex model using uh, recursion. Here's a quick comparison with some previous approaches to reverse mode AD. So there are some tape-based approaches that use the explicit tape to record operations in the forward pass. So this explicit tape, uh, we showed a correspondence with a defunctionalized version using function composition in the paper. Many approaches also return a backpropagator function instead of taking it as a parameter. But if we take it as a parameter, we can um, use some nice property of CPS, so we can uh, allocate intermediate values in the stack. Uh, recently, there's also this paper called uh, Compiling to Categories, which formulates automatic differentiation using um, an algebraic language from category theory. And this is some really nice properties, like a nice unification of forward and reverse mode. But um, yeah, so I think uh, reverse mode ideas, continuations in our paper, might be more accessible to ordinary programmers. So you know, even JavaScript programmers use callbacks. Here are some other explorations in the paper. Um, so it's possible to do higher order differentiation using multiple levels of continuations. Um, we can also do nested differentiation if we tag the derivative values. And it's possible to use a, a purely functional derivative update instead of mutation. But it turns out to be a bit more uh, complicated, since continuations may update uh, derivatives more than, for more than one value. So some future directions involve more tensor IR level optimizations, which we didn't pursue at all. But these are used in um, practical deep learning compilers. We can also add shift and reset to our IR for more natural higher order differentiation. And we can also do some more performance engineering. Great, so here's a summary of the points uh, in my talk. So this concludes my talk. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take a first question from online. Uh, so it's been said that algebraic effects and handlers are um, a nicer way of doing delimited continuations. Can you use algebraic effects and handlers instead of the full power of shift and reset? I see. Um, I think that might be the case, yeah. Although I'm not too familiar. Yeah. Are there any questions from the floor? Uh, hello, thank, thank you for a uh, very great talk. Uh, on the slide where you showed uh, conversion to C++, um, I've noticed that um, uh, you compile your loop to explicit recursion in, on C++ Lambda. Uh, do you rely on uh, C++ compiler to turn it into actual loop or, well, uh, I'm concerned that uh, actual recursion in C++ instead of uh, C++ loop will uh, decrease your performance. How do you uh, handle this? I see. Um, this is the actual C++ code we're generating. So this is um, a, the direct result, and we compile this with the C++ compiler. So in practice, it seems to yield um, OK competitive performance with actual deep learning frameworks. OK, there's a slightly related question. So the translation of a while loop is a recursive function, but it doesn't look tail recursive. Is that a, an issue in practice? I see. So. Um, yeah, so we have some more formal rules in the paper, and many of these come from the original work by Domvi and Flinsky. So we have another expression, we have another rule for a recursive function that isn't tail recursive. So the body after the n is just uh, expression two. So I think that might um, be more accurate here. There are some optimizations that were used to derive um, some more optimized rules. So this is what I showed here. Okay, I'll take another online one. Uh, is stack allocation of intermediates also possible when loops are used? Do you not risk turning time consumption into space consumption? Could you repeat the first yeah. question? Uh, is stack allocation of intermediates also possible when loops are used? So I'm not. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, does this not risk turning time consumption into space consumption? Um, it seems not in practice. Okay. Yeah, but theoretically, I think that might be a problem. And so another online one. So I believe a similar paper appeared at NeurIPS this year. If, if someone's read that before, could you explain the difference? There? Why should they read this paper as well? Yeah, so um, there are some new developments for this paper, mostly um, more formalizations of rules for PL audience. So we explained all of this on Lambda calculus instead of just on Scala. And there's also more extensive uh, evaluation and actual GPU implementation. So it's not just a prototype anymore. And a final question from Slido. Uh, how portable are these ideas? You've done it in Scala, but could I do it in any other language with delimited continuations or handles? Yeah, so I mentioned that many of these constructs, like shift and reset, are not specific to Scala. So many things are actually language agnostic, and we actually have related work implementing a Python front end uh, using these staging techniques. And so that's called SNEC or Autograph, and it's actually become an official feature of TensorFlow 2.0. Let's uh, thank the speaker again.